All right, well, let's go ahead and get started. So Clarence Goodman is a self-styled entertain entertainer and historian whose actual and literal travels have taken him all over the map. His love for his hometown and eventual, re eventual return to it have proven to be a blessing as his efforts have made him a favorite of libraries, historical societies, radio, television, and film. And he joins us now with one of his more than 30 presentations and historical concerts. So... Um, I just want to mention one other program that we have coming up pretty soon. If you love games, join us for Scrabble Club. Uh, it does get rowdy, believe it or not. Um, that is our next one. We've done it for a couple months now, but our next one is actually at August 7th at 7 p.m. sharp. Um, it's surprisingly a good time. So join us for that. <laughs> you don't you don't look convinced, Clarence. Oh no! I I, um, I am thinking of all of the near fist fights that I have uh, seen at Scrabble games. Of course, oh, yeah. drinking going on, and it almost <laughs> always involves a challenge, doesn't it? Right. We we do tea. We we don't do the heavy drinking for the library, but uh, we do provide tea. Okay. Well, that's good. <laughs> all righty. Oh, so am I on? You're on. It's oh, all you. Thank you, Jamie. And thank you, everyone else out there in Zoom land, especially those who work for, with, and around, and up and under the Deerfield Public Library. Good evening, and welcome to Game Time, lore and landmarks of Chicago sports outside of the lines, where instead of looking at team sports, and this guy did this, and this guy did that, and all those things, we're going to look at the things outside of the lines that define the playing field or the rink or the gym or the field or whatever that really have contributed to making Chicago not only a regional sports empire, well, not really empire, a uh, sports city, to an international one. Um, you don't really have to mute your phones out there, so uh, do what you need to do. Just stay on mute when it comes to the presentation tonight. Please hold your questions till the very end of our time together. And my friend Jamie will uh, squire and uh, shepherd those questions to me. All of the images, as always, I'm using within the fair use parameters of the American copyright law. I am Clarence Goodman. Here we go. Our first section is entitled Our House. In the middle of our street, Our House. Now, it's just entitled Our House, and it is about the incredible array of ballparks and rinks and gyms that we have had the pleasure of attending, if you're old like me, when it comes to Chicago. Now, uh, the first couple of ones were built even before I was alive. In fact, the oldest one in Chicago, Coliseum One, no photos exist. It was that old. And then there was something about a fire that did occur. It was in downtown Chicago at the corners of State and Washington, and it was built just after the Civil War. Now, after the fire and other things, urban renewal, gentrification, and so forth, made them get rid of Coliseum One. In Woodlawn, we had Coliseum Two opening up in 1895. And this is at a point where Chicago's population has grown to about a million and a half people. And then, as quiet as it's kept, Coliseum number three, and this is one that I have memories of, as well as some of you out there. Now, Coliseum three was in the South Loop area, very close to uh, Printer's Row, if you will, and it was at the junction of 15th and 14th, or in between 15th and 14th on Wabash. Opening up in 1899, and believe it or not, my friends, this was Chicago's first history museum, but that's another story for another time. Now, with regard to some of the things that our Coliseums have given, given us, particularly Coliseums 2 and 3, the first indoor game of American football, the first time that American football, that is hut, hut, hike, um, was played indoors in American history was indeed in Chicago, and it was indeed at Coliseum number 2. My goodness gracious. Coliseum number three, the one that stood until about 1980, I do believe, very, very famous for another of reasons, not the least of which was Teddy Roosevelt in his ill-fated run for the presidency in 1912 as the leader of the Bull Moose or progressive ticket 
Um, he had no idea he was being stalked by a would be assassin. And indeed, his potential assassin, John Shrank, wait outside the Coliseum doors for T.R. T.R. went out a different door, but he followed him to Milwaukee. And here T.R. is speaking in Milwaukee, shot down, but he did not die. Moreover, he delivered a 90 minute speech with a bullet in his person. And then at the conclusion of his speech, he said, take me to the hospital. None in, in Milwaukee, please take me back to Chicago. And he wound up getting treated at Mercy Hospital. Now, um, when the National Hockey League was founded, Chicago was one of the original teams, one of the original six, and the Blackhawks' first games were in the Chicago Coliseum. Oh, I just mentioned the original six. What a grand time to have been alive, if one were alive and one were a hockey fan, because that was truly a golden era. Also being delivered to the world via Chicago at the Chicago Coliseum, Roller Derby. Roller Derby makes its world debut August 13th, 1935, presented by Leo A. Salsa. What? I thought you said Salsa. Um, very, very famously, but apparently not famously enough, Jimi Hendrix played his first gig ever in Chicago, that is, at the Chicago Coliseum. And this was noteworthy because there was a young artist by the name of Cynthia Plaster and her band of renowns, other uh, women sculptors who called who call themselves the Plaster Casters. And to make a long and sordid story short, <laughs> um, they began the practice of endearing themselves and, and uh, to musicians and exciting these musicians in such a way that they could do plaster casts of a uh, portion of the musician's an anatomy. Jimi Hendrix was the first one. And by the time Cynthia Plaster, Chicago girl, passed away, her gallery, if you want to call it that, had more than 20,000 subjects. 1910 brings us Kamiski Park. And Kamiski Park has been the home of the Chicago White Sox, the Chicago Cardinals of the NFL, the Chicago American Giants of the Negro Leagues, the Chicago Mustangs of an early form of world football as played in the United States and specifically in Chicago. The Chicago Sting, there they are with commit at Comiskey with their ringer, a fellow by the name of Mr. T, Chicago boy. Um, when it comes to history, uh, the, the Cubs, what? I'm talking about the Cubs and Comiskey? Oh, no. Yeah, the Cubs grew in popularity at such a rate in the early part of the last century that the ballpark that they had moved into, Wiggum Field, and then renamed Wrigley Field, was too small. So they had to rent Comiskey Park from the White Sox, and they played all their games in 1917 at Comiskey on the south side and leave it to the Cubs to win the pennant in a year where they don't have access to their own ballpark. So it was during the World Series, during the seventh inning stretch, that the Cubs were all encouraged to stand at the lip of their dugout, remove their hats, and sing the Star Spangled Banner. And this was the first time the Star Spangled Banner was sung at a professional ball game in American history, to my knowledge. And then, of course, that starts one tradition and halfway starts another tradition. More about that later. That hot dog lover, Babe Ruth, by the way, yesterday was International Hot Dog Day, and I hope you all had a delicious vegetarian special like me. Babe Ruth was an interesting cat. You may have heard of him. Um, the, the back in those days when the when the national uh, when the American leagues and, and uh, national leagues were playing collectively as the major leagues, their schedule was 154 games and both leagues only had 18 teams in them. So these teams got really, really familiar with one another. And Babe Ruth came to Chicago so often to play the White Sox that he had a deal with one of the vendors there. As soon as the White Sox would make the third out, and Ruth was heading in from his position in right field, and he wasn't due up to bat, a vendor would have a hot dog ready for him. It is no shock with an anecdote like this and others that Babe Ruth had such a spelt, gorgeous, Adonis-like Adonis uh, figure. And speaking of Babe Ruth, so Chicago is in the middle of the country. 1933 is when Chicago's population 
hits about three and a half million people. But the the summer before is when the American League and National League decide, you know what, instead of just meeting once a year for the World Series, let's have an all-star game. And so the first all-star play game played was in Chicago at Kamiski. And of course, the first home run hit in an all-star game was Babe Ruth at Kamiski. There's his one-time buddy, Lou Gehrig, who hit a home run, I believe, that game as well. When it comes to traditions handed down by Kamiski, that wonderful song, na 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 na, hey hey hey, goodbye. That was a big hit, forty-five in uh, the nineteen seventies by a Chicago band called Steam, and that became a tradition at the ballpark of singing, serenading a losing team as they were getting ready to leave Kamiski. Sad thing is there weren't enough losing teams coming into Comiskey in the 60s and 70s for the most part, but it started a great tradition. Speaking of tradition, one of the greatest organists who ever played, the great, great, great Nancy Faust. I remember when she started her gig at Comiskey, and I remember when she retired. She was truly, truly, truly a person with one foot in the old school of old time ballpark stuff and the other foot, assuming she only had two in the new school. 1914 gives us a new ballpark, Wrigley Field on the north side of Chicago, 1914, as I just said a few moments ago, used to be called Wiggum Field. The Chicago Cubs have played there, obviously. The Chicago Bears have played there, not quite as obviously. The Chicago Cardinals of the NFL play have played there, really not as obviously. And then all manner of crazy winter game exhibitions have gone on in Wrigley Field. Look at that, my friends. You could not shag a fly ball in center field with too much success with an alpine ski ramp getting ready to hit you in the mouth or at least skier. Now, with regard to all of our beloved ballparks in the city of Chicago, Wrigley Field captured the minds and imaginations of people around the world eventually since the very beginning. You have a bunch of people too cheap to pay 25 cents to go into the ballpark and see the game climbing up the trees to see it. That's Chicago there. Uh, if there was any kind of karma, they fell in a pothole on their way down. Wrigley Field was the first ballpark to give us oh, 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 permanent concession stands. Because if you have been alive as long as me or longer, you have seen primarily mediocre to bad sports, not just baseball, but mostly mediocre sports professionally in Chicago with a few championships sprinkled in here and there. So you need some sort of buzz to get you through all of that mediocrity. Um, Wrigley Field, beautiful. Wrigley Field was the first ballpark in the history of North American sports to let fans keep batted balls and pucks, for that matter, in footballs that they catch. Now, this is a classic photo here, and from only about 10 years ago, maybe not even 10 years ago, my man here is not only holding his baby, feeding his baby, he is taking an out away. He's taking an out, out of the glove of the uh, Dodgers' wonderful first baseman, uh, Jose Morales, I believe his name was. That is multitasking. The first person to hit a home run in Wrigley Field, Art Wilson. Remember that name. There will be a quiz on it later on. With it, when it comes to legends, lore, and fabled stories, that's redundant, um, there's no bigger fable, no bigger story with regard to Wrigley than the World Series of 1932. Yes, that same year that Ruth went to the south side and hit the first all-star game home run, he comes to the north side to take on the Cubs in the World Series. Looking at two strikes early in the game, he silences the hecklers in the crowd and the bench jockeys in the other dugout. And he says, I'm hitting the next pitch in the center field. Chump. And he does. Babe Ruth's legendary call shot. Another story has to do with a far more sinister and um, darker uh, story here. We have Eddie Wakus. Eddie Wakus was a ball player, a serviceable ball player for the Cubs for many, many years. 
and he attracted some attention and he attracted a little of this, a little of that, but he had a steady job and he was a solid, good player. He got traded to the Philadelphia Phillies um, about midway through his career or unwittingly late in his career. He was traded to the Phillies. Now, he had his fair share of baseball ends. These are baseball groupies and so forth. And one of them decided, 19-year-old woman by the name of Ruth Ann Steinhagen, that if if she couldn't have Eddie, nobody was going to. So she tracked him to his hotel, his hotel room at the um, Edgewater Beach Hotel and Resort there that used to be on the north side, and she shot him. He didn't die. But he wasn't much of a ball player anymore. And of course, this inspires the book and the film, The Natural. Two very, very different stories. If you've never read the book, please read the book. If you've never seen the picture, shame on you. Now, when I was a kid, part of the lore of Wrigley Field was, oh, there are no lights and we'll always have these day games. And this is so wonderful. Well, um, P.K. Wrigley and the Wrigley family for that matter, were notoriously cheap as all owners of Chicago teams have tended to be. And it wasn't that there was something, oh, nostalgic and wonderful and flannel suits and sleeper cars and all that about having day uh, ball games at Wrigley Field. On the contrary, the the, uh, Wrigley family had all of the material, namely metal and iron and things of that nature in place and ready to put lights in Wrigley in the 1940s. However, there was a war going on, World War II, which called for a great deal of sacrifices by the people living in this country and indeed around the world. So one of the sacrifices made in this country, rationing of things. And so Wrigley donated all of the material that he was going to use for the lights at Wrigley to the war effort. Then after the war, he was too cheap to do anything about it. And it took many, many, many years for the Cubs to finally get lights, 1988. Moving on, 1924, Soldier Field, opening up in 1924 as Municipal Grant Park Stadium. As Municipal Grant Park Stadium and a Soldier Field, it has been home part-time to the Notre Dame football team, the Fighting Irish from Notre Dame, South Bend. It was a big deal every year when um, the the Notre Dame team and uh, the the University of uh, Southern California would come and play at Notre Dame. And that was a, it's not a big deal anymore because there's so many great college rivalries around the country. Um, A lot of people don't really care about this one anymore, but back in the day, that was something. In fact, there's a reference to this annual game and the wonderful play slash film Woman of the Year, Spencer Tracy, Catherine Hepburn. If you've not seen this film, shame on you. Check it out. Um, who else has played there? <laughs> um, in addition to the Notre Dame uh, fighting uh, Irish, we've also had the Chicago Cardinals of the NFL playing there. The Chicago Bears finally moving in there in 1971. The Chicago Sting of the old football league played there. The Chicago Fire of the new World Football League or whatever it is called playing there now. And then much like Wrigley, all manner of weird, weird sport exhibitions, including automobile stock car races. Man, that would get monotonous for yours truly. Far more interesting, though, and much more to the core of Chicago, the annual police and fire thrill show. So Chicago's bravest and finest would come out once a year and put on an exhibition. All these wonderful things they were going to do in pursuit of serving and protecting. Legendary games, I can't see anything. Neither could the Bears nor the Philadelphia Eagles. This was a playoff game in 1980. Eight, I do believe January of 88 or 89, beg your pardon, uh, the legendary Fog Bowl game. The Bears were hosting Philadelphia in the first round of the playoffs, and they were clinging to a very a fairly slim lead, and it looked like Philadelphia was going to do them in. And then a fog bank rolled in. It was like George Hallis just summoned it. This fog comes in. And the Bears won the game. That was the last home playoff game they won for a long, 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 long time. 
the National Hockey League has given us, or at least allowed Chicago to play host to the great winter classic. A couple of different venues in Chicago, Wrigley Field being one of them, but of course the one that captures a whole lot of attention, Soldier Field. I believe the first two were in Soldier, and then they did one in Wrigley. Now, with regard to uh, Chicago's international reputation, as Chicago was creeping towards the era that will be known as the Chicago Renaissance, the uh, Eucharistic, Eucharistic Conference of 1926 decides, you know what? We'll have this big conference there. The ballpark had just opened up a few years before, and so the, it became the center, the cradle of the uh, Roman Catholic world for a couple of days now. And then ever since then, anytime whoever the, uh, the sitting Pope is goes on a world tour or an American tour or a Western Hemisphere tour or whatever, and they schedule a stop in Chicago, it's almost always been at Soldier Field, or whatever the name of it is today. Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who ran for the presidency four times in um, his life. The last campaign of his, that would be 1944, What was it was one of those rare ones where he actually went out and campaigned, and he made his one of his last campaign appearances in Chicago at Soldier Field, 1944. 1962, the Army-Navy football game was scheduled to go off on November 2nd, 1963. The President of the United States, the Honorable Jack Kennedy, was getting ready to come because he was an old Navy man when the Secret Service got a tip that oh, President Kennedy would be assassinated in Chicago as his motorcade slithered and slinked through downtown Chicago, ragtop Jack, on its way to the ballpark. And so with the very last minute, Kennedy canceled his trip to Chicago to see the Army-Navy game, and they blamed it on the rising crisis of Vietnam. And of course, Jack Kennedy would die three weeks later in exactly the same circumstances that were outlined and sketched out for him to meet his end in Chicago. Martin Luther King spoke once, twice, thrice at Chicago Soldier Field in spring of 64. And then when he started to come to Chicago to desegregate it in the hot, hot, hot summers of 1965 and 66. And just weeks after her, her younger brother, Bobby, was assassinated in pursuit of the presidency. And indeed, in the town where Bobby Kennedy probably would have received the nomination at the Democratic Convention of 1968, across the park from where the Kennedy compound in Chicago would have been at the Ambassador, not the Ambassador East Hotel, I beg your pardon, at the Conrad Hilton Hotel, Eunice Schreiber, my favorite Kennedy, presided over the first Special Olympiad in Chicago's Soldier Field, summer of 1968. The first cellular phone call, baby, made from Chicago's Soldier Field. And for all of you dead heads out there, and you know who you are, the last Grateful Dead show to feature Jerry Garcia, and in other words, the last Grateful Dead show, because it ain't no Grateful Dead without Jerry Garcia. And I don't even like that band, but their last show is the Grateful Dead. September, I believe, 1995 at Chicago Soldier Field. Moving on to Chicago Stadium, 1929, a spectacular rink slash gym when it opened up. So much so that it has been the home of the Chicago Blackhawks, the Chicago Stags of the National Basketball League and Basketball Association of America, that was a mouthful, the Chicago Bulls of the National Basketball Association, the Chicago Sting of the National, the North American Soccer League, playing games outdoors and games indoors, apparently. Oh, moreover, the all-star game for that old league, the North American Soccer League, was in Soldier, excuse me, was in blah, 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 Chicago Stadium. 1984. Now. The indoor football thing tried for the first time in Chicago in the 1890s. That didn't catch on. Ah, 
A blizzard, though, forced the National Football League championships championship game in 1933, I think it was, indoors, where the Bears hosted the Detroit Lions and won. So the second indoor football game on a professional level, blink, Chicago's stadium. A legendary picture, the first version of the Manchurian Candidate was largely shot at uh, Chicago Stadium. And in many ways, my friends, um, Chicago Stadium was a bigger and more spectacular ballpark than the old Madison Square Garden. I believe there have been three Madison Square Gardens. Um, They're obviously playing in the third, but the second one didn't come close to being as um, completely tricked out as the Chicago Stadium was. Now, not only was the Chicago Stadium tricked out and beautiful, but the National Hockey League was so popular and the Blackhawks were so popular in Chicago that a new realm of security had to be created in Chicago. The Andy Frayne ushers created just to deal with all the rowdy puckheads like myself. Oh my goodness gracious, Chicago Stadium has the first huge, huge, huge pipe organ that absolutely, the memories of it being played and that old rink, that old gym, sending shivers to me right now. And then also the last um, analog scoreboard in the history of either the NBA or the uh, NHL, Chicago Stadium in that old place. Oh my goodness gracious, it was great. A Chicago Stadium tradition was born and then spread through the National Hockey League like wildfire. It was the 1972 Stanley Cup finals between the Chicago Blackhawks hosting the Montreal Canadiens. And the the Montreal Canadiens, if you don't know about hockey, the Canadiens are the New York Yankees of um, the National Hockey League. Um, The Blackhawks had not been in the Stanley Cup very often, and it seemed like every time they were, they lost to the Habs, the Habitants, the Montreal Canadiens. And so the Wirtz family, which owned the Blackhawks, said, let's do something to intimidate the Bejimbenes, I made up a word, out of the Habs. So every time the Blackhawks do something, score a goal, especially hit this foghorn button on the organ. And so begins a tradition in the Chicago with the Blackhawks, and it spread through every NHL uh, rink, to my knowledge, to this very day. And then another tradition started at the old rink. Chicago was the first place, and the stadium specifically the first place, where you'd have the man or woman or both singing the Star Spangled Banner. And by midway through the song, the crowd jumps in and they start singing louder and louder. And by the time you get to the last line or two, the crowd is drowning out the professional singer on the PA system. And the first time you're in person when that happens, let me tell you something. It is absolutely something, another Chicago tradition. Democratic and Republican conventions alike have called Chicago home for temporary home for the plurality of all of the political conventions, the combined political conventions in our nation's uh, history. Obviously, the Democrats have come here many times and the Republicans have actually come more than the Democrats because um, the grand old party was kind of born in this area and really, really the midwife at that birth, the Chicago Tribune. Nevertheless, after many, many years and uh, and the enjoyment of a mutual beneficial relationship between the GOP and the city of Chicago on the 1960 uh, Republican convention is in Chicago. And then of course, apparently, allegedly 100,000 dead Cook County Democrats voted for Jack Kennedy and the GOP has not been back since. 1934 brings us to Chicago's International Amphitheater there in Bridgeport. So for many, many decades, my friends, you had one of the great ballparks uh, in uh, Comiskey in Bridgeport, and then one of the more interesting venues when it came to everything in Bridgeport as well with the International Amphitheater. The International Amphitheater was the first home of the Chicago Packers, Chicago's first 
entry into the National Basketball Association when uh, the NBA decided to expand in 1962. They quickly became the Chicago Zephyrs because no Chicagoan wanted to root for a team called the Packers. And then they moved to Baltimore and became the Baltimore Bullets, later the Washington Bullets, and now the Washington uh, Wizards. The Wizards. Ooh, the Wizards. Ah, yeah. Um, yes, as I was saying, Chicago Zephyrs also play their games there, too. And then finally, when the NBA expands for a second time in 1966-67 uh, season, the Chicago, the city of Chicago gets another expansion team. And this, of course, would be the Chicago Bulls. Also playing at uh, the International Amphitheater, the Chicago Cougars of the WHL. Ah, my goodness gracious. Legends don't come bigger than this one. Elvis Presley wore his gold lame suit for the first time in 1956 at the International Amphitheater in Chicago. Uh, the International Amphitheater, like I uh, didn't get to before, but I should have said, or uh, waited till now. Yes, this is where the, the GOP came and were having their convention in 1960, and they have not been back since because of the shenanigans that uh, apparently the city of Chicago was up to. Don't know anything about that. A couple of years later, the Beatles began their first tour through the United States in what would be a brief but profound career, three whole trips to America in the summers of 1964, 65, and 66. And on that, uh, the, the 64 and 66 tours, they played in Kamiski. And the first one is the notable one because apparently next door at the, uh, the uh, steakhouse there, the uh, stockyard inn, yeah, someone grabbed a steak, a raw steak came into the uh, venue with it and threw it at the Beatles bass player. That guy, what's his name again? Uh, Paul Simon, uh, Paul, Paul McCartney. Yeah, they threw a piece of meat at Paul McCartney and apparently they connected, which is maybe one of the many reasons that Paul McCartney, as all the rest of the Beatles would eventually become, vegetarian. The 1968, Democratic convention comes to Chicago, and if the fallout for the GOP uh, convention of 60 was uh, an excrement show, the entire convention for the Dems in 1968 was an excrement extravaganza. Um, oh, professional wrestling given to you in Chicago, courtesy of Chicago's International Amphitheater, sponsored by the Stockyard Inn, right next door. I'm Dick the Bruiser. <sighs> Roller Derby comes back to Chicago and it is home and in, in the International Amphitheater. And if you were a little kid in the 1960s and 70s, got home from church, turned on that boob tube, you watched professional wrestling, you watched the Roller Derby, then you watched uh, Family Classics, turn on Mutual of Omaha, Wild Kingdom, turn on the Ed Sullivan Show. It was a really good night. And then you realize you had homework to the next day. Goodness gracious. Honorable mentions to newer ballparks, of course, Comiskey 2 slash U.S. Cellular Field slash Guaranteed Rate Feed Store and Emporium around since 1990, the United Center where the Bulls and the Blackhawks play around since 1995, New Soldier Field opening up, reopening up in 2003 after the, the uh, Bears vacated the ballpark for almost two years in order that they destroy a national landmark. And wow, it's not guaranteed to keep them. What a shock. And many, many honorable mentions to the home venues from so, for some of our other teams. Toyota Park, also known as uh, Seat Geek Stadium, which is where the Chicago Red Stars play and the Chicago Fire play. And then also the Wind Trust Arena, where um, a couple of our colleges play on occasion. Then, of course, the uh, WNBA Ska play, the sweet science, ladies and gentlemen, back before there was uh, mixed uh, martial arts and all of this other stuff, there was getting hit in the mouth or hitting somebody else in the mouth. The sweet science, boxing in Chicago, being in the center of a country, a legendary boxing city at a time when boxing was up there in the top three of uh 
professional sports when it came to popularity. And with that in mind, the legendary fight in 1927, I think it was between uh, Gene Tunney and Jack Dempsey and the fabled Long Cow. Oh, here's another one. One of the fights between the Brown Bomber, Joe Lewis, and gentleman Jim Braddock. Um, man, that was a, that was something else. Back, though, back in those days, up into the 1970s, the heavyweight division was something else. Actually, that extended into the 80s. Uh, the fight between Floyd Patterson and Sonny Liston. Uh, Sonny Liston, if you don't know anything about the history of boxing, Sonny Liston was... Mike Tyson on steroids as far as his reputation, his savagery, his mob connections, his brutality, his looking mean in the ring. This was a bad, bad man. So much so um, that when uh, Floyd Patterson met his fellow Catholic, President Kennedy, Kennedy beckoned him over in the Oval Office and says, uh, Floyd, whatever you do, don't fight Sonny Liston because he might kill you. And Sonny Liston did kill almost every man he ever fought. And then he met a fella named Clay. And another fellow who met a fella named Clay, smoking Joe Frazier, smoking Joe Frazier, the fable lefty from Philly, his last uh, professional fight, his last title uh, defense happened at uh, Comiskey, 1980, I believe it was. There's probably a date there, but I don't have my glasses on. Now I do, 1981, smoking Joe Frazier. And our triumvirates of heavyweight champions with regard to the American experience, we have Jack Johnson, the first African-American heavyweight champ, really, really unpopular. What a shock based on that. My man was hitting people in the mouth with one hand and spending money and, um, desegregating uh, the Everlay Club uh, single-handedly, if you know what I mean. For those of you who got that joke, you're welcome. And moreover, he moves to Chicago because Chicago was a happening, growing place to be. Not only that, he opens up his own nightclub, Jack Johnson's Café de Le Champagnon. The second of our triumvirate, the people's champion. The Brown Bomber himself, Joe Lewis, though he is associated with, Ma with Manhattan and all things Harlem at the height of his heavyweight fame. And when he starts to mull retirement, he moves to Chicago in the middle of Chicago's black renaissance. And here is Joe Lewis seen, shake, uh, seen shaking hands with uh, Satchel Page, another legendary fellow, but legendary uh, when it comes to hardball. And finally, a man who needs no introduction, the man known as Cassius Clay moves to Chicago before he wins the heavyweight title. Once he wins the heavyweight title, he opens up about having converted to Muslimism, that is having joined the nation of Islam, changes his name to Muhammad Ali and lets his fists and his mouth and his feet and his pretty complexion do all of the talking. The incomparable Muhammad Ali. Born in Chicago. Who was born in Chicago, Clarence? Wally Pip was. Who's Wally Pip? Glad you asked. Um, there are many people alive who don't know who Wally Pip was. Wally Pip was a professional baseball player, major leaguer, born in Chicago, who was first baseman for the New York Highlanders, who became the New York Yankees. And he had to take a day off once. There was a kid waiting in the wings to play first base behind him. His name was Lou Gehrig. And though Wally Pip got back into the game, effectively Gehrig rendered him expendable. And he was never the same guy. And he was also never the same guy after a bunch of injuries. And so Wally Pip sadly is known first and foremost for that. And his, his name is a verb. Oh my gosh, that guy Wally Pip me meaning I lost my job because this guy's better at it than me. Wally Pip, born and bred in Chi-Town. And apparently he was really, really good. Uh, so good that Lou Gehrig didn't take his job away immediately. George Papa, George Papa Bear Hallis, born in Chicago. Obviously the founder of the Chicago Bears, one of the first uh, teams of the National Football League. Many people would say the Packers and the Bears are the two first teams. George Hallis, a successful 
player at the University of Illinois down in Champaign and then a player and a coach, a player coach, a head coach, an owner in everything you can be with regard to the team that plays on the lakefront, at least for now. His name was Fritz Pollard and Fritz Pollard was, um, let me check something out here, friends. Forgot to do something, forgot to do that, okay. I've been making all kinds of faces for you and you haven't seen a one of them. <laughs> Rewind. Um, Fritz Pollard was the first African-American quarterback and head coach in NFL history, a guy born in Chicago. Johnny Weissmuller, an Olympic swimmer who became the first Tarzan. Um, Carol Burnett, eat your heart out. Ray Mayer the great legendary college basketball coach of the Blue Paul, Blue Paul, DePaul Blue Demons, the Blue Paul, the DePaul Blue Demons. Ooh, that was a difficult thing to say. Born in Chicago. Also born in Chicago and associated when, when it came to college with DePaul, the University of DePaul. That is the late, great, legendary George Mikan, the prototype of all big men in the history of the NBA. He led the Minneapolis Lakers to five NBA titles before obviously they moved from the land of a 10,000 lakes to La La Land. The man who was known as Richie Butkus until he was signed by the Bears and George Hallis told him, we're gonna call you Dick Butkus because it sounds meaner. Well, even if he had been called Twinkle Toes Butkus, he still would have been one of the meanest, toughest, most effective middle linebackers in the history of the National Football League, born in Chicago, went to Chicago Vocational School, then went to the University of Illinois in Champaign, Urbana. Uh, the talented woman whose talent and skill launched a gold web, a gold weather, a gold medal, and whose hairdo launched a gazillion trips to the beauty parlor. Chicago kid Dorothy Hamill. This is Bart Connor, another legendary fellow who was an Olympian um, when it came to men's gymnastics, another Chicago. Oh, they don't get much bigger and much more Chicago than this guy. Coach K, Coach Mike Krzyzewski, born in Chicago, and I dare say one of the few, few coaches in men's basketball and women's basketball for that matter, who understood and mastered the old system of college basketball recruitment, signing, coaching, and the like, and then dealing with these kids coming in now and doing one and done, or kids bypassing college altogether. Coach K can coach anywhere, especially now that he's retired. Marv Levy, another Chicago uh, kid, um, a winner of four Lamar Hunt titles. That is, he took his Buffalo Bills to the NFC championship game and won four times. And then they got to the Super Bowl where it was another story, but a great coach and a really nice guy and a really smart guy. I met him in an airport once. And the incomparable Dwayne Wade, born in Chicago, not only a basketball storied, storied individual, but also now a co-owner of the Chicago Sky. Chicago Innovations. For those of you who did yoga this morning, I say namaste to you. We are going to move through this next sun salutation from South. Yoga was not invented in Chicago, but it had never been in America, or that is it had never been in an American venue for the public to see and participate in until the World's Fair in Chicago, 1893. Look at those yoga pants, folks. And a couple of years later, oh, lo and behold, the first stock car race, the first motorized road race in American history starts in Chicago at those same fairgrounds of the World's Fair, right near the building that we know and love as the Museum of Science and Industry, from there to Evanston and back over Thanksgiving weekend, 18 and 95. And Harvard and Yale decide they're gonna go around the country and put on baseball exhibitions for colleges that don't have baseball teams. Brilliant idea. They come to Chicago, to the University of Chicago. Once again, we're in that neighborhood and they put on <clears throat> this exhibition of baseball. 
However, it was the middle of winter. And so they had to play indoors. After busting a couple of windows, breaking some lights, scaring a lot of people to death, they said, you know what, let's take the ball and let us wrap a bunch of masking tape. And I don't know if duct tape had been invented yet, but it would have been perfect, especially for guys who want to cheat. And they wrapped it and they made it soft. So they had this indoor baseball exhibition. And somebody clearly from Chicago said, hmm, I like this whole thing about a softball. And from that idea, softball was invented in Chicago. And ladies and gentlemen, let's be very clear. Most Americans play 12 or 14 inch softball using their gloves. The vast majority of Chicago would still play 16 or mush ball. I got a broken finger to show it. The forward pass, even though there is a certain amount of beauty watching an open field runner like Gail Sayers or watching a guy go through mitosis and split into two like Barry Sanders in a running game. But thank you, city of Chicago, and most specifically, thank you, University of Chicago football team and Alonzo Stagg for bringing us the forward pass. Makes those three hours watching a football game that much easier and that much more poetic. Shall I compare thee to a forward pass? Speaking of pretty, the beautiful, beautiful American game of basketball was made even more American by some of the improvisational skills like so many jazz musicians. And indeed, when the jump shot, the hang time jump shot was invented legendarily by a gentleman, of course, his name was Sweet Charlie Brown. Mm, 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 mm. We were on to something there and made the game of basketball beautiful, even more beautiful. This combined with the advent of the shot clock turned basketball it was the beginning of, of, the, of basketball becoming an absolutely beautiful, beautiful game. And speaking of beautiful, beautiful games of basketball, the first time an all African-American squad won the NCAA tournament was the Ides of March, March 15th, 1963. The Loyola Ramblers came, rambled in there, and won that bad boy. And they didn't even need Sister Jean to come out there and help them. Innovations of hockey. Most hockey players played with flat blades for the longest time. And then in the 1960s, two Chicago Blackhawks, more than anybody else, popularized the curved stick. Bobby Ho, Stan Makita. And if you ever played hockey out there of a certain age, you know who you are, and you played with a flat blade, and then the first time you used a curved blade, oh my goodness gracious, oh, it was a revelation. And speaking of equipment, Chicago, home of originally the Spalding Sporting, Bro Sporting Brothers, Sporting Goods uh, Corporation. Oh my gosh, some people ride Harleys, some people ride Schwinn's, Put me in the latter category. Schwinn, there's nothing like a Schwinn bicycle. Chicago's Schwinn bicycle. Wilson! Yes, Wilson Sporting Goods, born in Chicago, still headquartered in Chicago. And for those of you who went to college or just have a rec room in your mother and father's basement and you have uh, been down there with a drink in one hand and some sort of board game in the other or participating in a big, big uh, table game, Chances are it was made by Brunswick, a Chicago corporation. Talking heads, stop making sense. Same as it ever was. Not talking about the band talking heads, talking about really important Chicagoans. Meet Bill Veck. Bill Veck might be one of the most important people to ever be involved in baseball. Um, when he was the owner of the Cleveland ball clubs, he did a number of things, not the least of which was sending a little person up to bat where he would walk all of the time, but he helped to integrate the American League. And indeed, he was the only owner when he bought the contract from um, Larry Dolby, who was playing with the Newark Ball Club of the American Negro Leagues. Bill Beck was the only cat who paid the owner. He actually bought the contracts out and um, compensated the owners of the team. None of the other Major League Baseball players did this when they were raiding the Negro Leagues. In addition to this, Bill Beck comes to Chicago and he installs three important things. The exploding scoreboard at Comiskey 
the hand-operated scoreboard at Wrigley and those beloved ivy-covered walls. He planted the ivy on the brick walls on the inside of Wrigley. He also hired um, a concession uh, worker by the name of Jack Rubenstein, who was slinging hot dogs and popcorn and beer at the time, and then eventually he would sling for the Capone organization as kind of uh, an associate member of the Co Capone organization. And, um, and then he wound up in uh, Dallas, where he did come to some infamy down the line. Jack Brickhouse, one of the nicest fellers I ever met that when I was a little kid. Jack Brickhouse, to my knowledge, the only individual who was called games for the Bradley Bruins, the Chicago Cubs, the Chicago White Sox, the Chicago Bears, and the Chicago Bulls. A deserving member of the Baseball Writers Hall of Fame. By the way, Pat Hughes is on his way there this weekend to be inducted into the uh, Broadcasters Hall of Fame. When you are on North Michigan Avenue and you've just crossed over the DuSable Michigan Avenue Bridge, look to your right, you will see a bust of first, Jean-Baptiste Point DuSable, and then you'll see one of Mr. Brickhouse. Tap him on the shoulder, because he's a great guy. Hey, Steve, Harry Carey. Ooh. Harry Carey, talk about a fabled dude. Harry Carey started his career um, at the highest level, calling games for the St. Louis Cardinals and the St. Louis Browns. And then while he was working in St. Louis, there was some hubbub, bub. Um, he was run over by a car. And the legend about him, my mother and many people have told me various versions of this story, was that Harry Carey was running around with the owner's wife. And this was a message to him to not have sex with the owner's wife. And so the Cardinals didn't want him dead and they still wanted him back. And so Harry Carey at a very, very big celebration, the opening game, the following season, they're introducing the Cardinal players and there is Harry Carey in a wheelchair. Oh, there's, oh, what a coincidence. There's a Cardinal outside my window. I kid you not. How cool is that? He's sitting there in a wheelchair with all of these bandages and casts and whatnot on. And then out of nowhere, like Willy Wonka with Gene Wilder, he jumps out of his wheelchair, runs up to the microphone and says, hey, I'm back. I'm back. Harry Carey. A um, lot of shenanigans, a lot of show. He comes to Chicago and he calls games for the South Side team. And this is where he, at the behest of Bill Vec, starts the tradition of singing Take Me Out to the Ball game during the seventh inning stretch. And ladies and gentlemen, I'm not sure if you know this, but that, line, that, that, that part that everybody sings is only the chorus of that song. There are three verses that lead into that chorus. Um, if you want to hear them, you can probably find a version on YouTube. And then the wonderful movie, Take Me Out to the Ball Game, I believe Messrs. Kelly and Sinatra sing the entire uh, song. Um, yes, Harry Carey, busy out there in the outfield, not only leading people in singing of uh, Take Me Out to the Ball game and so forth, but he actually called games from the center field bleachers. And that was really something. As a little kid from the south side, there's Harry Carey with no shirt on. And then after a while, he is kicked upstairs, or at least north. He signs with the Chicago Cubs. I believe he did one year at um, in Oakland and he comes up to the north side and he has passed his prime, but he arrives just when WGN is bought by the Chicago Tribune Corporation and WGN is made into a super station, an internationally renowned satellite station. And so between this and Harry Carey and the beauty of Ridley, Ridley Field, Ridley Field's always been very videogenic and telegenic. The Cubs, in spite of their poorness, forever become one of the most popular teams in the world. Other talking heads, Jerome Holtzman, a brilliant, brilliant sports writer of the glory days, born in Chicago. Lou Boudreaux, Hall of Fame ball player, Hall of Fame broadcaster, born in Chicago. Lloyd Pettit, the great Lloyd Pettit. Nobody called hockey games like this guy, y'all. Um, the great voice of the Chicago Blackhawks for a number of years. Johnny Kerr, Johnny Red Kerr, Hall of Fame ball player, I do believe, Bulls Ring of um, Honor, and also a local broadcasting Hall of Fame honoree. Bob Elson, another great one. 
another kid who came to Chicago and broke his teeth on WGN or broke his teeth with WGN just as they were starting to take off. You've heard of football, the original NFL pregame show, the NFL Today on CBS featuring two Chicagoans, Brent Musburger and the late great Irv Cross. Speaking of Chicagoans, a rare picture of the brothers Gumble together. These guys are both so busy. Greg on the left, Brian on there, on the right there. The late great Stu Scott, Stuart Scott, born in Chicago. And then people who are honorary Chicagoans because of their affiliation with the Northwestern University School of Journalism, sports journalist, Gary Marshall. My goodness, a wildcat and an honorary Chicagoan. The great, maybe the greatest biographer who's living to today, Jonathan Eig, another Northwestern guy, another Chicago dude and a Northwestern guy. This is the great Michael Wilbon of ESPN, the NBA on ABC, I think it is now, and then also, of course, the Washington Post. Oh, my friends, the great, great, great Nicole Wallace. She, a former speechwriter for the GOP, and now one of the many talking heads on um, MSNBC. I'm sorry, I, I, I live in an old house and I've been cleaning and getting ready to move, so my throat is full of dust. Rich Eisen. Stuart Scott's old partner on ESPN Sports Center, the great, great, great Rich Eisen and uh, a lifelong Jet fan. So I'm rooting against you, Rich. And my man, another Jet fan, my man, Mike Greenberg, the man who famously says on his famous radio program, very popular uh, radio program, he might have been born in Brooklyn, but he was reborn when he came to Chicago to attend college where he met his wife and both of his children have one has just graduated from the school and his son is going there now. I believe he is a theater major. And finally, my friends, I present to you the most important person in the history of American sport, maybe all of North American sport. I present one Charles K. McNeil, graduate in accounting from the University of Chicago. My friends, you're asking, who is this dude, Clarence? My friends, this is the man who invented the point spread and changed sports forever. If he knew what he had wrought, when you go to the ballpark and more people are looking on their phones and people can make bets now from their seats and from kiosks all over the ballpark, I wonder if he would feel a little bit sorry that he weren't alive to cash all of the checks that he would have gotten, Charles K. McNeil. And so my friends, as we tie a bow on this one, I hope I've been able to illustrate to you that Chicago is a transcendent city when it comes to sports, but not just the stuff that happens between the lines, but also outside of lines. Look for me on the History Channel, a new show called Dark Marvels just dropped featuring yours truly, NBCChicago.com, a little piece on me um, talking about African-American history. And then hopefully next year, um, a segment I did for Chicago Stories, PBS WTTW. My friends, it's been a pleasure as always. Big shout of appreciation to my buddy Jamie out there and everyone else associated with the Deerfield Public Library. Until we meet again, God bless you. God keep you. Keep on rocking your library. Back to you, Jamie. Clarence, thanks so much. Um, that was entertaining as always. I did disable your video just so you know, because we there's a uh, white, oh. there's a flashing light behind you and we couldn't see your face. So I just disabled that. So oh, that's called the sunset. I'm it sorry. It looks a little better now. <laughs> yeah. No. Um, so yeah, we don't have any questions right now, but if you guys do have questions, um, if you could put them in the chat, uh, that would be great. We'll hang on for just a minute or so. Um, you did mention the Grateful Dead. I know you're not like a huge fan or anything, but we did a program with them two days ago, which was great. We had a lot of deadheads in the room. So okay. if you are a deadhead and you're an attendee, you can email me, you get my emails all the time and I will share the link with you. It's not public because we had, of course, some um, 
issues with the copyright. So we can't make that uh, live on YouTube, but uh, we can share it directly to you. So let me know if you're interested. I mean, it was, it was fun. I'm not a huge fan either, but uh, you know. Oh, I hear there are riots and <laughs> all of those cats could play. Um, and right. Garcia was great. This is just not my cup of tea when it comes to uh, music, but all of those cats could play. Is there, uh, while we still have you, is there a Chicago area band that you you are a fan of? Um, let's see. Who is my favorite Chicago area musician? I would have to say Jim Peterick, Speed, Speedy Recovery. And that's only because I've met him a couple of times and he lives about a half a mile from, uh, from where I'm sitting right now and i have followed his career since i was a little boy and then who would have known would have guessed that i would meet him he was playing at my high school his band oh. just changed their name to survivor and he was playing at my high school that's awesome nice dude nice hair <laughs> what a guitar collection his guitar collection is insane oh yeah awesome um, well, I don't see any questions. Um, I know you have a ton of other programs, so we would love to have you back and, um, Please. good luck with all your future endeavors. It seems like you're, you're pretty busy. So guys gotta have, got guys gotta stay off the street. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you again. Uh, very entertaining as always. Um, and enjoy the rest of your summer. It's beautiful out there. Thank you. You too, Jamie. Good night, everybody. Right. God bless. Thanks. Have a good night.